Sometimes you get to singing a song and you just forget the words that you're singing almost. But as you sing those words and just let them impact your heart, I mean, I, I love verse 3 where it says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. What a, what a more powerful, powerful statement to know that not just part of our sin, every bit of our sin was nailed to that cross and we don't have to bear it anymore because of His sacrifice and what He's done. And uh, it kind of fits really well with what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, we've been talking about discipleship the last couple of Wednesdays. And, and we're going to close it out with this discipleship on really two different things. One being being equipped. Uh, equipped, having the right tools, and then how Jesus sent. Um, so we're talking about equipping and sending tonight is as we, we really focus in on this. And, you know, if you think about, you know, one of the, I remember when, we, when I worked for Advanced Auto Parts, um, soon after I graduated college, I worked for a bank first, and then I started working in Advanced Auto Parts in the pricing department. And, and there's two different sections, really. You had the DIY section, which was the front of the store, where you had all the parts people could buy and stuff and do themselves. And then you had the, the uh, kind of the business side of it, where the, the, the shops would come and, and get stuff for their businesses. And, and you know, D DIY is a big terminology in this world. A lot of people view themselves as DIY. You know that I don't DIY. I don't do it myself. I call someone else. My father lives too far away to call him now. But you, you, you'll think this is, you may think this is funny. I thought it was. I was, had to put a new dishwasher in our house a couple weeks ago. And, and I went to the hardware store three times. And I was sitting there and I was like, I got to call my dad. But through the miracle of technology now, you can FaceTime. So I said, Dad, what do I do here? And just turn the phone at it. And he, he told me. I mean, that's just, Dad, i gotta, I got to learn that stuff because one day that may be me. But he was able to tell me through FaceTime how to fix the problem I was having with my dishwasher. I was installing. But DIY, if you think about it, it, it refers to people who are tackling home improvement projects themselves, who are going after things and really fixing it themselves. Uh, but if you think about it in, in general, I, there's a show on television where it's called your fir The First Flip, where people who are do flipping their first house, and you can see it kind of even makes fun of them. It has little bubbles that pop up and say you sh they shouldn't have done it this way, or they shouldn't have used this, or shouldn't have done that, and it, it's kind of comical. Uh, but m millions of people attempt to tackle home improvement projects, but just attempting a project doesn't make you a DIY person. In fact, there's one main difference that exists between someone, uh, DIY people and non-DIY people, and that's tools. Right? If you don't have the right tools, you cannot get the job done. You could say that I'm, I'm going to go out and fix this myself, but if you don't have the tools to fix it, guess what? You're just spending, wasting time, wasting money. Um, you can usually tell if a person's really into uh, uh, fixing something or making something or whatever it is they're doing. It, they're experiencing it by the tools that they use. Do-it-yourself people have learned from experience that the right tool is often the difference between a, a job that's been well done or an expensive mess. Uh, for that reason, DIY people equip themselves with the tools that are needed to accomplish their goals. You've got to be equipped with the right tools. Uh, here's a question that you should consider honestly. Would Jesus himself give you a job to do without equipping you to be successful? You think, I, I do job, if you, if you were, you know, your job, you were trained to do the trade that you do. You had maybe, maybe you, maybe you were just thrown into the fire, I don't know. But, but most places, you, you go to school to learn how to do something, or maybe you had an orientation phase where at least told you some of the basics. You're trained to do something. We are, as believers, are trained to be disciples. Don't you think that Jesus himself, who's calling us to this mission, who's calling us to this task, would also give us the tools that we need? And we know, that, of course, the answer to that is yes. He would, he would give us the tools, and He has given us the tools. So tonight we're going to look first at how we see Jesus has equipped those disciples as He sent them out to fulfill that mission, to fulfill what He had given them to do. So if you turn your Bibles with you to Matthew chapter 10, we're going to be there first, and then we're going to go to Matthew 28 later on in just a little bit. But Matthew 10, as you're turning there, really kind of marks a turning point uh, we see in the lives of Jesus' earliest disciples. Until that point in time, the disciples spent most of their time with Jesus, following Him around, following Him around and, and, and seeing Him and learning from Him. They traveled with Him, served with Him, ate with Him, even celebrated with Him. But in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus now sends them out. 
He says, okay, you followed me, you've done the work with me, you've, you've witnessed how I do things, you've witnessed how I healed people, how I do these things, now you're going out. You're going out to serve, and he sends them out in pairs to minister away from them. So we're going to look really at verse 1, and then we're going to jump down to verse 5 through 15. So follow with me. Verse 1 says, Summoning his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. Verse 5, Jesus sent out these twelve after giving them instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. You have received free of charge, give free of charge. Don't take along gold, silver, or copper or for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a walking stick, for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it, and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return with you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. I assure you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town." So we see here as that Jesus is sending these guys out. He's sending them out and he's saying, basically, don't take anything with you. Don't take money, don't take food, don't take clothes. Take what you got on your back and go. Right? Get to, just go and, and send them out. And he trains them. He says, I'm training you. I'm giving you what you need. Go. I'm equipping you. Right? You're going you're gonna to obtain what you need. And, and so, so we, we think of that. And I don't know about you, when I read that and understand, if Jesus is sending me out, I've got to make sure i got the right clothes to go, right? I, I, I get hot very easily, which means I, I sweat a lot. So I want to make sure I have enough shirts that's going to last me. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to walk around in sweaty clothes, right? And it's just that's the, how my mind starts working. He's like, you can't take any, don't take anything with you. Why? Because Jesus provides what we need. He provides what we need in every scenario, every situation in life, everything that we come up against. And that's what he's telling his disciples. In our efforts to live as his disciples, Jesus equips us with a number of important resources. Uh, we have the Bible. Of course, we have the Bible. We have His Word, His precious Word, which serves as our foundation for understanding God, the world, uh, and history. We also have access to the church, the people around you, the people that you come in contact with when you come into worship, a community of brothers and sisters working together to serve God, to glorify God. We, we all have our unique mix of talents and abilities. We all have things that we're good at, things that we're not. Most of the time, things that you're good at, there's somebody else who may, or you're not good at, there's somebody else who's good at that. You guys would be a great pair to go out and serve. Because you kind of pick up. Like, Katie's good at a whole lot of stuff. I'm not really good at much, right? And, and she fills the gaps where I fall short. I don't really feel many of her gaps. She's just, she's just that good. She's not even here, and I'm talking good about her tonight. She's over there helping Lindsay. Uh, but still, how, again, how would you like to see, though, we, we, we know that, and we know we have the Bible, we have the church, and we have our talents and gifts that God's given us, but still, how would you like to receive these instructions from Jesus? Again, reading verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons, you have received free of charge, give free of charge. I mean, those are some pretty uh, heavy instructions, right? If, if Jesus came to you and said, I want you to go out and heal the sick people. I want you to go out and raise a dead person. I want you to go out and, to those that have skin diseases and cleanse them, drive out a demon. Most of, you, most of us would be like, whoa, whoa, I'll pray with somebody, right? I mean, those are pretty heavy. If you don't think you can handle those commands, then you're absolutely right. We can't handle those things on our own. People don't possess such supernatural abilities on our own. We cannot do those things on our own. The only way the disciples were able to do it was because Jesus himself had, a grant, had granted them power, his power, his authority. Remember back in verse 1, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal disease and sickness. Listen, disciples today, meaning us, you, me, we are given, we're also we're given an incredible goal to achieve, the advancement of God's kingdom throughout the world. The advancement of his kingdom. For that reason, we must never lose sight of the crucial uh, truth that our most important resource in following Jesus is access to Jesus himself. Being able to access him, talk with him, commune with him, study his word, uh, and encounter him. Listen, Jesus equipped 
His disciples with His power and His presence in order for them to obey His commands. And the great news about that is that He does the same for us. He does the exact same thing for us. He equips us to do the things that He's called us to do. That's why sometimes when He's pushing you out of your comfort zone, He does it to remind you that, look, hey, you can't do this without me, buddy. Right? You, you can't do this without me. Maybe for some of you, you, haven't, you don't sign up to help teach the kids because kids scare you to death. I say amen. Right? I mean, my kids, whew, they put on a show here, but, man, they're crazy. Right? You guys see Colby. He's, that boy, he's a candy machine. If you don't give him candy, he's going he to let you know that he's not happy about it. Right? And, but, but, I mean, kids, but that, guess what? That God may be asking you to do something to push you out of that comfort zone, to give you, and he's going to equip you give you the resources you need, go about it. I mean, I'll never forget, I think I've told you this before, but um, when I was a youth minister, we, we did Awanas on Wednesday nights, and, and in that program, it's similar to All God's Children. We, um, we had different teachers for different age group of classes, and I had, nobody wanted to teach the kindergarten, first, and second grade boys because it was the biggest class and the wildest class. Right? Those boys are just, they're crazy. It's a crazy age. they got so much energy. They don't want to listen because they've been listening all day at school. Right? And so they come in and they're ready to party when you want to teach them the Bible. And, and I, I never forget, I, I, this one of our, the deacons who was there at that time, 75-year-old man and, and his, his wife, she's probably 20-something. I, I don't know how old she was. She's the same age as him. But um, she, she, they came to me and said, we really feel like we want to help and want us. And I said, I got the class for you. And they went in there, and you'll never, I mean, Spencer learned, Spencer, my son was in that class. I won't be ashamed to say it. He was in there, and he was probably one of the crazy ones. But, but, I, but he learned so much because they were willing to take a step out of their comfort zone, go in there to a class that may look difficult, but they let God equip them. And I ne- Spencer learned so much from them. He loved going to Mr. Doughton's class. He loved going there and learning from him. And if they weren't there for some reason, those kids let them know that they weren't happy that they weren't there. Right? Because they were willing to step out and realize this, that, that God still equips us. He still gives us His power, His presence to do His task, to go out and fulfill the mission that He has given us for our lives. And then we see also in this passage that Jesus clarifies what we don't need. He gives us very specifically what we need and what we don't need. Right? Not only did He equip the disciples... But he also made sure they understand the things that they did not need in order to carry out his mission. We think we need all these things. Jesus, give me this stuff, and then I'll do your work. Right? Give me, equip, give me all these things, and then I'll do what you ask me to do. But again, looking back at verses 9 and 10, don't take along gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a walking stick for the worker is worthy of his food. Now, does that mean you should get rid of your suitcase on your next mission trip or that you should abandon your credit card or debit card when you serve in your church? No. Right? What it means is this. Jesus was calling his disciples to let go of what made them feel safe, what made them feel comfortable before they went on mission, before they went out and did his work. Why? Because he wanted them to rely completely on him. We get so used to when we serve the Lord and serve Him, we get so used to relying on ourselves and things that can empower us that we think are helping us instead of relying on Jesus. Instead of relying fully on Him and trusting in Him, falling into His arms and letting Him hold us up as we complete His task. That's what He's reminding them, to trust in Him. You, you, that stuff may be essential. Yes, you need to take clothes. Yes, you need to do this on a mission trip. But you need to trust in Him more than you trust in your supplies. More than you trust in your tools. Listen, as, as, as modern Christians today, we need to understand that what Jesus is calling us to do is far beyond our own abilities and resources. Far beyond that. To be, to be frank with you, if your concept of following Jesus fits neatly into the American dream, our, our, or our culture's concept, conception of a normal life, then you need to stretch your understanding of what it means to be a disciple. The following Jesus doesn't fit into the American dream, right? It doesn't fit there. Why? Because Jesus, is meant, Jesus pushes us. He, he broadens our understanding of what it means to be a disciple. He pushes us out of our comfort zone. Following Jesus should force us to rely completely on Him. And if you've ever been in a situation where you had to rely completely on Him, you know exactly what it feels like. 
whether it was on the mission field, whether it was doing something, uh, maybe serving with the kids or serving with the youth or teaching a Sunday school class, whatever it may have been for you, praying with somebody where it's just totally out of your comfort zone. You knew you had to do it. You knew God was telling you to do it, and you did it, and you had said, God, I'm trusting in you. Just like when Peter stepped out of that boat, he had to rely fully on God when he took that first step out of the boat. Or he would sink, right? And then he kept walking. And then what happened? Started, his trust started to waver. The, the, the life got in his way, the storms, right? And that will come up and cause us to waver sometimes. But we must remember we've got to fully trust and completely rely on him. We, we, he equips us and he clarifies the things that we don't need. As disciples, we have all that we need in Jesus. We have all that we could ever need in Him and following Him and trusting Him and doing His work. We, we've become very, very good at making excuses of, well, I don't, I don't know enough to do that. I can promise you, you'll never know enough to do some of the things that God calls you to do. I, that was one of my, again, my, my main excuse was, was talking in front of people. One of mine going to the ministry was, I don't know enough. What am I going to do when somebody asks me a question about the Bible that I don't know? Are they going to think I'm not a good pastor? Because I don't know the answer to the question. No, you just have to understand that, look, sometimes you've got to say, I don't know. And, and, and trust in God. Or sometimes I, I've, I've gone to situations where it's been like, Lord, I have no idea what to say. No idea what to do. I trust in you. Just give me the right words to speak. And, and go in and do exactly what you tell me to do. And you'll be surprised how he responds. You'd be so surprised. I mean, I'll never forget. I, I, I don't know if I've told you this before or not. One of my first things when, when the, the pastor I used to work for, he got sick. Uh, I did all the visiting at that point. And I went out and I got called to the hospital to go. And I didn't know this lady. Uh, it was a, a lady in our church. It was her daughter. And she had gotten sick very quickly and then went to the hospital. And I was told she was hovering around, passing away. I didn't know she had passed away. And I didn't know she was still in that room. I didn't know what I was going to encounter when I came in the room. And I just prayed, God, give me the words, the right words to say to help comfort this family. And I walk in, and there she is. Have you ever seen somebody who had just passed away? You know, it's, it's especially, you know, I've, I've only seen it once or twice. And that was family. But you go walk in there, and it's like, your whole tendency is just to clamp up and, and run away, which was mine. But you've got to trust and rely on Him to give you the words to speak, to show you the things to do, to, to, to understand that it's okay, and to rely on Him and let Him do the talking. So we, we talk about equipping, now we talk about sending. Because what are we equipped for? We're equipped to do something. We're equipped to be sent. right? We're equipped to be sent out into the world, to send out and to go out and do the work that He has called us to do. So turn over to Matthew 28. Uh, again, great commission. Uh, the last few verses there, verses 16 through 20. He talks about equipping the disciples. Now he's sending them out. His, his earliest disciples kind of really experienced a roller coaster at this time. Uh, during the final weeks of Jesus' public ministry before he was put to death. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus' first his death on the cross kind of sent them into confusion and deep despair. Then Jesus' resurrection uh, kind of lifted them back into the clouds of joy. And then finally, his ascension ushered in the sobering reality that now the disciples would now continue carrying out Jesus' mission without his physical presence standing there. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it would be a lot easier doing some of the things that God asked us to do if Jesus was standing right beside me. Right? If he was physically in the flesh standing right there saying, you're going to do great, I, I got your back. Right? You know how if you have your friends around you and they're encouraging you to do something, and you, you have that, that faith behind you, you know that they're standing behind you and they're cheering you on, and even if they, you mess up, they're still going to love you, right? If I had Jesus standing there saying, go, I got your back. I'm going to speak for you, I'm going to do things for you. That would be a lot more encouraging, right? But that, now they're, they're, that's what the disciples are in. They're in this place now where Jesus is he's gone, his presence is gone, but he's still with them. Uh, so before Jesus returned to heaven, though, he gave them uh, his orders to summarize the mission. And this is a familiar passage to all of us. We, I, I know that you know this passage, but we refer to this again as the Great Commission. So look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Verse 18, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission, that statement right there, those verses, summarize Jesus' mission not only for His early disciples, but for all the disciples to come after that. For all believers that came after that, uh, we'll, we'll conclude tonight really by taking a look at this. Uh, a look at this passage and looking at the commission, look at how we're being sent. We've been equipped, we know that we're equipped, we have the tools, and now we're being sent. But where are we being sent? Jesus tells us exactly where to go. The first thing to highlight about this statement in these verses is His claim to authority. Why is it important to understand that all authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. Because His great commission, these statements that He's saying here, is a series of commands. He is simply ordering us to obey Him. Right? He's ordering us. You know how people order you to do things. You're like, yeah, I don't have authority over me. You can't tell me what to do. Right? I tried to tell my babysitter, my babysitter that one time when I was growing up, and that didn't work out well. Right? And um, you're not my mom and dad, right? And that just doesn't work out. But Jesus is, is ordering us to obey Him. Therefore, He first wanted to state that He has the authority to do that. He, he's stating the authority that I have the authority to give you these orders. I have the authority to tell you where to go and what to do. Next, it gives us a geographical connection. Jesus uh, commanded us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. No, notice in that statement that Jesus' command is active. It's not passive. We can't look at that and say, well, that was for the past. Right? No, this is an active statement. He didn't command them to think about the world. He didn't ask his followers to say nice things about different people groups or people of ethnicities or, or races. No, Jesus commanded his disciples to go. To go. This doesn't mean all Christians should abandon their jobs and leave their families and serve as international missionaries. However, it does mean this that all Christians should take an active role in spreading the gospel throughout the world. All of us, no matter what age, no matter what ethnicity or race, no matter what, we're all called to be a part in spreading the gospel. We're all called to go out and help in spreading the gospel. We're equipped to do it. We just looked at that a minute ago. Now we're looking at how we're sent. And now we know that all of us are equipped and sent to go. Now notice how Jesus' command also involves all nations. All, all nations, Jesus died for the sins of all people, which means uh, the gospel has power for every tribe and nationality across the world. We cannot forget that Jesus has commanded us to proclaim the message to all who need to hear it. Not just the ones that are nice to us, not just the ones that we think we may get some kind of reward if we do it to. Even if a member in, in this, I'll just say, even if a member of ISIS came and you had the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Would your heart be full of hatred because of the acts they committed or would it be full of love because that's what Jesus would have wanted? Some people ask, would, would you think God would want Osama bin Laden to be saved? I answer that as yes. He was a person that was created. He was lost. Very lost. But he's still a person. He still fits within that Great Commission category of all nations, all people, right? To ignore the spiritual needs of people outside of our homes, outside of our city, outside of our county, outside of our state, outside of our country, is to disobey the Great Commission and ignore what Christ has commanded us. He tells us where to go. Go everywhere, wherever you go. That's why the whole con I love the concept of living your life on mission. Seeing everywhere you go is a mission opportunity. Finally, he tells us what to do. He tells us what to do. Not only did he tell us what, where to participate, but he also gave us a clear process to go through that can carry out that mission. Verse 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Now, this process is key to understanding our mission as followers of Christ. It's essential. It's an essential piece. We're called to make disciples, and we start by proclaiming the gospel everywhere that we can. When our efforts produce fruit, 
Meaning when someone accepts Christ or makes the decision to follow Christ, baptism is the next step. To be baptized is to be pub publicly announce yourself as a follower of Christ. Uh, unfortunately, many Christians believe this to be the end of the process. We got them saved, we got them dunked, now they're through, right? We just let them come to church when they want to and, and, and that's it. But that's not where the process ends. That's not where, where it ends. It, Jesus says differently in the Great Commission, when we proclaim the gospel and engage the process of making disciples, we're responsible for the last part of that too teaching them to observe everything He has commanded us. We can't leave that part out. That's the process of discipleship. We're equipped to do it. We're sent out to do it. We just don't fulfill that ending peace. Most churches in this world don't fulfill that peace. We, we, we want to get the numbers up of people coming to be saved and, and the baptisms, and then we just stop there. And it's something we see all across the country. This, this kind of teaching involves people learning about God and His Word, but it also goes way beyond information. When we teach people to observe what Jesus has commanded us, we teach them this, we teach them to obey. We teach them to obey God's Word. And the only real way to teach obedience is to model what needs to be obeyed. To model the obedience that's needed. And the only real way to teach obedience, again, is to model, in other words, one of our main goals in living out the Great Commission. If you want to say, where do I start in living out the Great Commission? Living out the being a disciple is to connect with new people who are new converts in Christ, who are new believers in such a way that we provide an example of how to follow Christ. And people look at your life and see a devout follower of Jesus. Yes, you may, I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up. But can they look at you and see that you are a person that obeys Christ? that follows Him, that trusts Him, that does the things that He asks you to do that may not make sense. Can, can, can somebody look at you and see that in you? That's the first step. Saying, how do I, how do I start? Look, you, you may strike out going, I'm not telling you to go door to door and, and asking people to, to you know, turn or burn, right? Don't do that. you get your door slammed in your face. I'm saying live a life of obedience to the Lord. And you'd be surprised at how many people that you can impact that way. How many people that you come in contact with that will look at you and say, man, there's just something different about them. There's just something different about them. And then if you're doing that and also praying, God, let my life be obedient to you. Let my life be a light for you. And then pray for God. When, when I come across somebody and they ask me, help me to explain to them why my life looks different. You'd be surprised and amazed at the opportunities that he would open for you. To simply share why your life looks different. Not better, different. Why your life looks different. We're called to, to be holy, right? And holy means set apart, different. But somebody's going to ask you, why, what's different about you? How can I get what you have? We're called, we're equipped, and we're called to do what Christ has commanded us to do. And that's to fulfill His final words. To go Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that He has commanded us. First step for most of us is just obeying Him in our everyday life. Obeying Him in the things, whatever it be, seems small or big. No matter what it looks like, simply just obey. Maybe it's signing up for Bible school for you. Say, well, what kind of impact can I have at Bible school? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how many of those kids that come through the doors you'd be able to impact. Maybe even some of the workers. You don't know who God has put in your place, you put you in that place for a certain reason, to impact a certain person. And all he's waiting for you to do is fulfill your divine calling. For you to step in and say, God, I want you to use me. I want to obey you. I want to do what you've asked me to do. I'm not going to let my uh, fear stand in the way. I'm not going to let my, my timidness or shyness stand in the way. I'm going to do exactly what you've asked me to do. I'm going to fall into your arms. I'm not going to trust in my own abilities. I'm going to trust in you. My prayer for you is that you would take that to heart and realize that some things that God calls you to do, most things He calls you to do, you're not equipped to do. He can equip you to do it. 
He will equip you to do it. He will equip you and, and give you the abilities and the, the, the gifts that are needed. All you got to do is simply obey. Right? A song, Trust and Obey, there's just no other way. We must trust and obey. Let's pray together. Father, I, I pray at this moment for each of us in this room, for those who are not here tonight, Lord, as we look at the fact that we're all called to obedience. Where you equip us, you send us, you tell us exactly what to do. So many times we fall short. We don't trust. We, we try to trust in ourselves and our own talents and abilities. And they just fall short. Help us to trust in you and fall squarely back on your shoulders and trust in you and fall into your arms and your grace and your mercy. Lord, help us to obey you in what you've asked us to do in our life. Even if it looks scary, intimidating, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Some of the things you do, God, in our lives don't make sense. That's because our thoughts are not your thoughts and our ways are not your ways. You're bigger than us. Our brain cannot handle your, the, the vastness of your love and mercy. It cannot handle the, the, how, this, how large your plan is for us in this world. But we can't obey and we can offer ourselves up to you to be used. Father, that's my prayer for each person here tonight. That they would look in the mirror when they get home, when they wake up in the morning every day, and they would see a person that's not here by mistake, that's not here by chance, that's here on this earth to fulfill the purpose that you have given them. Help them to, to look in the mirror and say, I will obey, I will trust. Father, we pray that you send us out. Give us opportunities to speak with people about your word. Help people to see something different in us so they can ask us, what makes you different? How can I get what you have? What a great opportunity that would be to be able to clearly just share the gospel right there of what makes us different. Not better, but different. Father, we love you and we ask you to be with us this week as we continue out throughout the week. Bring us back on Sunday so we can worship you together. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you. Sunday.